Good. Welcome, everyone. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's guest, uh, Darren Korb. He is an award-winning composer and audio director for Supergiant Games. He has composed the music, generated the sound effects, and recorded the voiceover of all the titles of their studio, which are Bastion, Transistor, and Pyro. And he has presented on a number of occasions, for example, at GDC. And interestingly, he began working on games without knowing anything about games, nor about sound design. So, and he made a career out of it. So it's great to have him here, and uh, he will tell you of how to make your games great, and particularly about the acoustic effects. So, welcome, Darren. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, yes, I am Darren Korb. I'm the audio director for Supergiant Games. It's my pleasure to be here today. And I'm going to talk to you about game audio today. And I'm calling this Guerrilla Audio, Do It Yourself By Any Means Necessary. Uh, and sort of the idea behind that is, uh, <laughs> with a sort of tactical approach to audio. You don't need a big AAA budget. You don't need hundreds of people. You don't need, uh, you can, with sort of calculated strikes, you can uh, execute effective game audio just with your own abilities and you and maybe a friend or two. So who am I and why exactly am I standing up here? Uh, like we said, I'm the audio director for Supergiant Games. Uh, I worked on Bastion, Transistor, and Pyre. These are the three games that we've made. And like a lot of you, I imagine, uh, I had no prior game audio experience when I started working on Bastion. That was the first game I ever worked on. A friend of mine, Amir Rao, who co-founded Supergiant Games, just sort of asked me to work on his game that he was working on and do all the audio for it. And of course, I just said yes, because he thought I could do it. And that was, <laughs> that was it. So I sort of dove in uh, head first to game audio, like I imagine a lot of you are doing right now. Uh, working on your projects for this class. So I've worked also on a shoestring audio budget, uh, <laughs> like I imagine many of you are, are doing as well. Student projects are not particularly well funded, uh, so I've heard. <laughs> so <laughs> resourcefulness and perseverance uh, are, are your friends in this case. And if you have a bunch of those, you can sort of remove the need to have a bunch of money uh, and make the best of what you have uh, with a combination of those two things. So who's Supergiant Games? Let me just tell you a little bit about the studio. It's a small team, and we try to sort of multiply the impact that each one of us can make by working effectively and tactically in a sort of guerrilla fashion, so to speak. Uh, so seven people made our first game, Bastion, in a living room in San Jose. That's the living room there. That's uh, over there is, that's Gavin Simon on the left. He's uh, our co-founder and uh, one of our engineers. Gen Z there is in the middle. She's our art director. And Amir Rao is there on the right side. And he is uh, another co-founder, my childhood friend. Uh, he's the drummer in my band for a long time. And uh, <laughs> we, we've known each other since we were eight years old. And uh, this is his dad's living room, which he, where we played D&D &D growing up and all that. Uh, and, this, and he was kind enough to sort of let us make a video game in his uh, living room. So that was very nice of him. And Amir, uh, I should say, is the uh, main designer and, uh, and co-founder of, of the studio. Like I said, studio director. And we were all, we're all friends. Like I, like I mentioned, uh, all the people who work at Supergiant, for the most part, at least on Bastion, had connections to each other before the project. Uh, and a lot of us sort of just, you know, Amir kind of pulled a lot of us together, uh, friends that he'd made through the years. Logan, our main voice actor, uh, he and I went to high school together and did a improv comedy and plays and all that stuff together. And, and he and Amir played soccer when they were 12 years old. And, and, and so, you know, we, a, a bunch of friends are, are sort of what, what made this studio. Uh, so let's get into what, what I'm actually here to talk about, uh, which is what, what does an audio director do actually? What is, what is my, my job? Well, normally uh, an audio director determines the aesthetic and creative direction for all audio in a game. And that is something that I do, but in a lot of ways what I do is different from what an audio director of a larger team or a bigger company would do. Uh, usually the audio director is the boss of all the other audio creatives on a project, so they would interact with a composer and uh, request certain types of music and tell the composer what types, what scenarios are gonna be needed, how they want the music delivered, things like that. Uh, if, if you're talking to sound designers, uh, generating lists of sounds that need to be made, things like that. 
I don't do any of that because I do all that stuff by myself. Uh, so I'm technically the audio director, but uh, I, I essentially am the entire audio team uh, for the most part. <laughs> so I kind of I I tell myself what to do and what I need delivered to me, uh, basically. So I'm a one-man band, uh, so to speak. Uh, I wanted to get a really good picture of, of Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins, but I just couldn't find like, the, like, the crucial still. So I chose this rando from the internet instead. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, I compose the music, I make and implement sounds. The implementation, I definitely have some help from programmers, uh, but yes, I, may, I make and implement the sounds, and I've had, uh, since Bastion, a little bit of help on, on that front. I've, uh, we've contracted out some sounds on Transistor, and I did contract a little bit of like audio editing on some voiceover on, on Pyre, but for the most part, I'm doing it, uh, doing it on, uh, all by my lonesome and uh, I direct and record the voiceover. So you'll all be doing some amount of this stuff for your projects because you, know, you are all the audio team and the everything else <laughs> on your projects. So that's, that's why I feel like this is relevant to your lives right now. So the trident of audio is what I'm, <laughs> I'm calling this. Music, voiceover, and sound. Those are the three like, main prongs of what I'm gonna talk about today. And, and first, I want to talk about what, what is the goal of game audio? What's the point of it? Why, why <laughs> what are you trying to achieve with game audio? And so my take is that music, voiceover, and sound, and implementation all serve to deepen player immersion, reinforce tone, and provide feedback. So I'll get into each of those a little bit here. Uh, the immersion, you know, a lot of these, these sort of speak for themselves, but, you know, they allow, uh, immersion allows players to lose themselves in the game. Uh, it's, it's that heightening that experience where you start playing a game, you're really enjoying it, and you look up, and all of a sudden it's six hours later, and you, you know, don't know what happened. That, that feeling uh, that it's just a complete experience, and there's nothing reminding you that you're playing a video game, making you want to look at your watch or your phone or whatever. So that's, that's sort of one, one of my goals with, with deepening immersion. Tone, so, you know, pretty straightforward. The overall mood and thematic thrust of a project. Uh, what are you trying to make the player feel? And feedback. This is information about uh, player actions and, and states. So uh, what that means is when a player swings, presses a button and swings a hammer and hits something, the, the expectation is that that's going to make a sound. Uh, whenever you interact with the game in any way, you sort of expect it to make a sound. So you're just sort of satisfying player expectations. That's a lot of what you're doing here with the feedback uh, component. The power of audio. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how, so well, first of all, I'm going to show you a very early prototype from Bastion, which was made in that living room that you saw. This is maybe two to four weeks into development, I think, on Bastion. It was basically just Amir and Gavin kind of cranking away and making prototypes. And I was sort of off in New York separately making music in my apartment. And, uh, and so this, this is going to be, uh, what I'm going to show you is, is that. And what I want you to pay attention to is there's a piece of music playing that ended up shipping with the final game. And so uh, I just want to show you this to illustrate how music can begin to bring out a tone uh, and start to express the tone before any other aspect of a project, if that's all there is. So let me play that for you now. Up a little bit. Great. Thanks. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that little gray dude was, uh, you know, modeled and animated by Amir, who is, needless to say, not an artist. Uh, but but you can see, like. There's just, there's nothing. There's a dude with a hammer, he's gray. There's, you're just looking at art scanned out of D&D books and stuff. There's no, it's, you know, there's nothing, this game has no identity yet. But 
the music is starting to assert an identity even before there's anything else. So that's just to give you an idea of what I feel is the power <laughs> of, of music specifically in this case. And, and even some of the sound effects there, the toggling in the menu that you heard, that's, that actually made it into the final game in, uh, in one form or another. So I'm going to show you now, this is a clip from the finished game uh, that shipped. Uh, these are both clips from the same level in Bastion called Prosper Bluff where you meet a survivor of this calamity that happened that tore the world apart. And uh, what I want you to pay, so they're both, both from the same level. This is at the, the left one's at the beginning of the level, and the right one is sort of at the end, when you actually meet this, this person, uh, Zia. And I want you to pay attention to a few things here. Try to pay attention to the soundscape, uh, the ambient audio that's happening, the uh, sort of action sounds when you're attacking, enemies getting hit, things like that, and also the music, how the music sounds to you. Uh, and, and the narration. There's going to be a sort of combination of all the things I'm talking about in this clip here. Okay, I'll stop that there. But so a couple of things that you can notice in that clip right there. So there's a layer of ambient sound, which is just sort of the background noise on the level, uh, sort of uh, river rushing, rustling leaves, stuff like that. There's the actual actions that you're performing, providing sort of player feedback. Uh, when you attack an enemy, you hear the sound of the impact, you hear the sound of the weapon firing, you hear the enemy react to getting hit, things like that. And then uh, one thing, uh, actually right at the end there, when you walk into that gas cloud, there's the, the entire uh, soundscape is filtered and muffled uh, to, to reflect the player's sort of uh, impaired state, if you will, getting poisoned by that poison cloud. And you can also hear uh, a song playing. So the song is coming from a place in the level. So I'm sure you've heard the term diegetic in this class before. It's diegetic music coming from Zia who is somewhere else in the level. And then you know, the narrator is talking to you in a non-diegetic way, meaning he is not present, talking right into your ear. The difference between those, uh, well, you can hear that the song that was playing was reverbed out, sounded like it was coming from the space. The way it was treated was different from the narration, which is dry and right in your ear. So that's one thing. And also, the narration is giving you context for what's happening. He's talking about the place. He is even reacting to and setting up the piece of music that's playing. Uh, so let me, let me skip ahead to the end of the level. This is on a, oh, and there's one more thing down here. Uh, this is actually, I captured this from a score attack mode. So there's some like UI sounds and stuff in there too that, that aren't, aren't normally in it. But uh, this one is from a different playthrough here, but this is the end of the same level. So I'm gonna show you that right now. This is when you meet Zia, and I want you to pay attention to the treatment of the music in particular here. Okay, so some things I want you to notice in that, uh, particularly the music. When you are further away from the source of the sound, you hear reverb, it's coming from mostly from the left speaker, it's positional, and then as you get closer, it sort of widens in the stereo image, becomes stereo, like, it, like something would when you approach it, and the, it dries up. So you're hearing more of the principal instead of the reverb. And so that's reflecting you actually reaching the source of the sound. Uh, and, and then, of course, the narration is talking about uh, w what's happening there. So let, 
let me, uh, and the reason I wanted to show you this particular thing is because I think it's a really good illustration of the synthesis of all the different disciplines. So games, in my opinion, that are successfully immersive have the tone reinforced by every single aspect of the game. So Prosper Bluff uh, is the product of interdisciplinary efforts across the entire team. Uh, writing the story moment in which you meet another survivor, Greg, that was uh, our creative director was responsible for that. Uh, composing and recording the song that she's singing, that was my department. Writing and recording, and, and I will say actually the, the lyrics are sort of based on this massive world document that Greg, the creative director, had written. Uh, and so they're based in the world. The song itself is trying to tell you something about the world. Writing and recording the narration to give context and meaning to the moment. That's, that cuts across uh, a few of us on the team. Greg wrote the narration. Amir served as his editor. Uh, Logan and I recorded it, and, uh, and I sort of edited it, passed it back to Greg, and then he implemented, implemented the narration in the game. Uh, and then the level design, so the, it's actually designed like a spiral, and that's Amir who, who designed this level. So, and, and part of the reason it's designed like a spiral is you are constantly circling around the source of the music, so it's changing position in the stereo image, and you're getting closer and closer. It gets louder and louder as you progress through the level. Um, and that's something that was deliberate, deliberately planned across multiple disciplines. And then, of course, the art design of Zia, the enemies you face, as well as, uh, uh, as the look of the entire level. Uh, all of that stuff serves to come together to uh, deepen the immersion and, and uh, try to tell you things about this world. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat these few things a few times in this talk. Deepening immersion, conveying tone, and providing feedback, context, meaning. So let's dive into the first aspect of this trident of audio properly, if you will, music. Uh, this, by the way, is Ashley Barrett down here, who is the uh, singer of the song you just heard. She's a friend of mine that I met in New York, but we all grew up in the Bay Area, apparently. We had a bunch of mutual friends. Uh, so yes, reinforce tone, deepen immersion, provide feedback. That's what I am aiming for whenever I make a piece of music. And, and roughly in that order. <laughs> uh, it can be diegetic or non-diegetic, which I discussed earlier. Uh, diegetic is the sound source is visible or implied to be present, which is something I'm sure you guys have covered before in this class. And then non-diegetic is the opposite of that. Music just playing, uh, not from a particular source. And music is an opportunity to inform the player about the game world through the sonic palette and style. So what I mean by that is Every choice you make, the instrument choices, the tempo, the feel of a song, the style of music, all of that can tell the player about the world of the game. Uh, for example, Bastion, uh, what I did at the beginning of that project was I sort of invented a genre for myself to try and, and <laughs> tie, it, tie everything together. And so I called it acoustic frontier trip hop. Uh, <laughs> so, and there's, <laughs> there's a point to that, which is, the, it's got like a Western feel from the acoustic instruments. It's got sort of an exotic feel for the frontier part. So I use a lot of uh, sort of Eastern instruments and things like that. And the trip hop feel is sort of sample percussion to sort of tie it all together and give it an otherworldly feel and put you in a different place. So let's talk a little bit more about music. So you have an opportunity to provide feedback via implementation. And what I mean by that is you can do different types of implementation, dynamic, or uh, which is sort of state-based uh, or static. Let me get into that right here. Um, so dynamic music means that there are components of the music that change based on what's happening in the game. And s for example, entering a fight, uh, maybe a different stem kicks on, the drums start playing when you enter a fight. Uh, there's a different mode or the end of a fight. All that can be signaled uh, with dynamic music. And static music is just sort of playing a stereo track. Uh, and you can start and stop it, you can fade it in and out and do whatever you could do with a, you know, one piece of audio. But well-composed and placed music should enhance and convey the tone of the game at any given moment. So let me play you a little clip from Transistor here. Let me, let me just, uh, while this loads, <laughs> talk about it real quick. So uh, pay attention to, right in a second here, you're going to enter like a combat area and the drums are going to kick in. So we have music playing the whole time uh, without drums, and then you enter combat, and drums, a drum track that's been silently playing turns on, and then you can hear it. And then uh, we're gonna, the player's going to enter a state called turn mode, which is sort of our tactical planning mode. 
and uh, uh, pay attention to what happens to the audio there. Uh, let, me, let me just play this for you. Okay, so if you notice, when you, go into the, when you go into the turn mode, there's a lot of things that happen. Uh, it's an entirely different state. The, the world sort of turns digital, and there's a grid all over the floor, the dots. And what's happening is we wanted to make this feel contemplative and like you, you're taking your time, uh, and you're in the character's head when this is happening. So Red, our protagonist for this game, is a singer who's lost her voice, and so this was an opportunity for us to really put you inside her head and let you hear her singing. Uh, and so we decided to have a humming track that plays along to every piece of music silently, and then when you enter this mode, it kicks on, and the rest of the music is, there has a, a high pass filter on it, so it sounds muffled, and like it's coming from outside of this state. And then uh, her humming itself is loud and clear. So that, that, that's an example of uh, providing some feedback for this alternate state as well as giving you uh, a line on the character and trying to give you a little bit more context for what's happening in the world. Let me do the next thing. So when approaching music, you know, that's a common question for people who don't have a lot of music experience and I, I'm not sure. Just real quick, uh, who here is a CS person? CS? Okay, most people here. Music people? Music people, a handful. Okay, cool. All right, cool. That's sort of what I expected. I'm my all right, <laughs> the right spot. Okay, so where to start? Uh, so use whatever you can. That's sort of the. It's sort of a simple thing to say, but but it's very true. Uh, Royalty-free music and samples are your friends. You can use them. That's what they're for. Uh, uh, some composers are sort of feel icky about doing that. I have mixed feelings about it. But if you do it in a way that is creative and interesting and make it your own somehow and incorporate it into a piece in an interesting way, then, then I certainly have no problem with that. Uh, and GarageBand is a great free resource if you have a Mac. Uh, it, it really is powerful and has a ton of awesome loops built in and stuff that you can really, can sort of jumpstart your imagination uh, a little bit. Uh, as well as there's free internet sound libraries uh, as well. So that, you know, those are, those are a little more hit and miss. Uh, but whatever you use, try to create a unique musical point of view. So in other words, I want you to use your tools in unexpected ways. And that's what I try to do. So on all three games, I use a combination of loops, samples, uh, software instruments, and real instruments. So let me show you an actual session right now of mine. Um, this is a session for a piece of music from Pyre. So I'm just going to play it from the start and, uh, and go for a bit. And then I'm going to break it down. Uh, as to what what is what what's actually being played, what is a sample, and and what is a loop? What's what's a software instrument? Okay, 
So uh, let's break that down a little bit. So down here I have a base part, which I performed. So let's just hear that. It's filthy. Uh, and <laughs> we got a filthy base part. And then uh, up here we got, so let's see, we've got a, a lot of drums happening up here. We've got, uh, this is the sort of amazing auto drummer thing that's in Logic, and it's, it's in GarageBand as well. It's less full featured, but it's pretty incredible. Uh, so that's what this track is, if you want to hear that. Oh, you're getting some, some reverb from another track that I bust through its uh, <laughs> reverb channel. But, but anyway, you have that. You have uh, a lot of other percussion here that it, these are uh, loops. that I've combined. If you want to hear them individually, here's this one. And I actually based my bass line on uh, what's implied there in that, uh, in, that ri in that loop there. And then that's the main thing you're hearing, the backbeat. And that's just weird. Adding weirdness, which is always good. And then, uh, and then uh, I've also got some more live instruments. I've got a mandolin down here. There's a lot of mandolin in this tune. Let me play these tracks for you. And that particular mandolin riff is actually doubling a loop that I found that I thought was really cool and I wanted to incorporate. And so I've taken that and chopped it up and put it in different part, parts of the stereo image uh, for the riff and everything like that. So uh, now one more time all together. Oh, actually, there's one more thing. This uh, right down here is a synth part that I've incorporated pretty prominently. <laughs> and <laughs> if you hear those individually, you wouldn't necessarily think to put them all together. Uh, and that's part of what I like doing is sort of challenging myself to put things that do not seem like they will go together together in a way that is uh, interesting or harmonious or something. So. so there you go. I'll get back back to it. Uh, <laughs> let's let's move on to uh, voiceover, which is the second prong of our trident of audio. So again, repeat this one more time. Reinforce tone, deepen immersion, and provide feedback. But this time, I feel like uh, that voiceover is, is uniquely equipped to provide narrative and context in a way that the other components cannot necessarily do. Uh, I mean, in, in a way that they can. They can, but, but not like this. Uh, so the sonic style and presentation should provide insight into the game world. So what I spoke about earlier uh, on Prosper Bluff, you hear the narrator really dry and right in your ear. So that would be, let me get these both up. Uh, narration, you want, or at least in this case, you, we wanted him to sound like he was sitting right next to you telling you a story. So that would be really dry, no reverb at all, right in your ear. But in Transistor, uh, by contrast, the, it's actually a character in the game world that's speaking. So it's actually the, the, the Transistor itself, the sword, is talking. And so there's reverb that is sort of uh, supposed to emulate whatever space the character is in. And it changes as you go. It dries up in a smaller space and gets bigger in a more open space. Uh, and, and things like that. But the point is that that tells you something about your relationship to these characters uh, and the game world itself. So you don't need a recording studio. Make the best of the spaces and mics that you have access to. That's something that I believe firmly. Recording studios are wonderful. I interned in one for a very long time. I love working in them. It's awesome. However, it is not necessary <laughs> if, you, uh, if, you, if you put in the elbow grease. So Bastion and Transistor were actually recorded in my closet. So I'm going to show you a little tour of my New York apartment circa 2010 uh, when I was recording the voiceover for Bastion with Logan. Let me show you this here.
so yeah, all, it's all recorded in my, in my in my closet. Not even in. I don't. It's not like I had a walk-in closet. It was like a opened up kind of closet. Uh, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, close mic. So one thing you may have no, well, you probably didn't notice in that video. You'll see it in the next one I'm about to show. So some techniques you can use to overcome not having a perfect space for recording is close miking. So normally you'd have an actor be anywhere from you know here to a foot away, a couple feet away, depending. I mean, if you have a super quiet space, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, you know, a foot away is pr pretty good. But uh, in the case of Bastion and, and Transistor, I recorded Logan as close to the mic as possible, a few inches away. And the, the reason you don't want to do that all the time is because it can <laughs> create a strange thing called, it, it's called proximity effect, where when you get closer to a microphone, it sounds boomy and unnatural. I mean, it can sound cool, but uh, not necessarily natural. So that's why you don't normally do this. But if you close mic somebody, then the difference in level between their voice and the background noise is more than if they're further away from the mic, uh, essentially. So, so you can have a kind of a noisier space and get away with it if you close mic somebody. And uh, hang up blankets, put down rugs, which I did, you can see there, <laughs> covered in uh, moving blankets. And uh, take the time to get the right take and edit the voiceover and treat it like the vocal in a piece of music. So not a lot of you are music people. What I mean by that is uh, the, the vocal in a music mix gets fussed over probably more than anything else in the whole thing. So uh, if, if you apply that to voiceover, then you really edit it, especially in a place that's noisy, edit out all the little bits of noise in between, just make sure it sounds really clean, as clean as possible. I spent a lot of time you know, ducking the uh, plosives and S sounds and sibilants that was harsh and, and really and automating that manually. Uh, so let me show you uh, an actual, this is a view from inside the closet. Uh, I'm gonna show you uh, Logan doing some takes for a line in Bastion. So uh, here, let me play that for you. Great, so let's, um, let's make it happen. Uh, <laughs> so that last one is the take we use in the game. Uh, and and this, this is not standard, as far as I understand it. Uh, normally, I think a voice actor will do like three takes, move on. Uh, just because you don't have, it's just very expensive to rent a studio and uh, work with a uh, union voice actor and all this. We were, you know, we were doing this by the seat of our pants, so we just like, we're going to do it until it was awesome. Like that was our, <laughs> you know, if it's not awesome, we got to do it again. Uh, so that, that was our approach. And that's sort of what I mean by fussing, fussing over it uh, as much as possible. Make sure it's as good as it can be. Uh, 
<laughs> Logan was very kind to put up with my direction <laughs> there. So uh, let's take a little break for some clarifying questions here before I proceed. Uh, any questions before I move on? Yeah. What is your compositional process? Do you use traditional compositional tools like Kadalias and Canali? That's a great question. So the question was, do I use traditional composing tools? Uh, and I don't, actually. So I'm not, uh, my background is I'm a rock musician. I play guitar, bass, and drums, and I sing, and, and, and I have a songwriting background. I theoretically can read music, but I'm not good at it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't write, compose pieces by writing them down. I, I compose them generally by playing and, and you know, uh, recording something, uh, or actually you, the, the actual recording itself a lot of the times is how I compose a piece. Um, I use the production as like an important part of my creative pipeline, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Definitely. So the question was, do I rely more heavily on my ear or theory when composing? And the answer is definitely my ear. Uh, I have, you know, a, <laughs> I've at some point or another learned like most of the theory stuff, but, but I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't rely on it that much and don't have a big, a great command of it. I'm not a jazz guitar player. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, that's not my, my thing. It's, it's mostly my ear. Uh, and I, I have, you know, stuff that I know works and I have uh, some theory in my back pocket if I, if I get stuck or if I need it. But, but usually, um, usually I'll pull out the theory if I can't figure out anything else another way, <laughs> basically. Yeah. That's a good question. So the question was, how did I know at such an early stage uh, that the music would go with sort of the other components of the game, right? So, so uh, the, the answer is we, we had discussions about tone and discussions about what should the game feel like. And we, you know, batted around phrases like, what if Cormac McCarthy made a fantasy video game? You know, like, stuff like that. And that's what I ran with when making that. And then some of the other aspects of the game, you know, at, w what would happen is because of the way we worked, I was on the project from the very beginning, people could hear what I had done and respond to that tonally and, and vice versa. So, and, and you know, we kind of go in a cycle like that and respond to what, what each other would do. Jen would make, uh, like a, our, the art director would make like a postage stamp is what we call it, of each different area, like each different zone from the game. And that would really sort of express what that area was all about, the vibe of it, what, uh, you know, and, and I would then go and compose music based on those uh, for, for a lot of the game. Uh, I think nine or so of the pieces were, were made that way. And then a lot of them were made just sort of, you know, messing around with, what if Cormac McCarthy made a fantasy video? What would that sound like? What's the music for that, you know? Uh, and then after I'd sort of developed the idea of acoustic frontier trip hop, I could just sort of make stuff in that genre without a particular focus, like, oh, let's try to make a high energy thing in that genre. Let's try to make a moody thing in that genre. Uh, and and that's, how I, that's how I approach that. With the music, specifically? So the question was, wh wh what are some techniques for making sure that the player doesn't get bored with the music? Uh, that is a good question. I'm actually going to cover that in the implementation part. So, uh, so yeah, I won't get there yet, but I'm going to answer that. Any other questions before I move on? Sweet. I'm doing it. Pulling the trigger. Here we go. The final fork of the trident of audio, sound. Sound effects. So again, Reiterate this in a little bit different order this time. Provide player feedback, reinforce setting and tone, deepen immersion. Uh, and you know, I, I, if I had a thing to circle it, I would circle provide player feedback as the most important thing for me about what sound effects do. And something that helps creatively when making sound effects is theming. So if you pick a theme to unify the sonic palette for all the sound effects, then you have a direction to go in. It's a lot. It's a lot easier to have some guidance than to be looking at sort of a blank session with no idea what to do. Uh, so, uh, for example, for Bastion, I used building sounds for all the menus because uh, that was the theme of the game, uh, trying to rebuild the Bastion. Uh, synth, digital stuff, and ma uh, plus magic for transistor for all the, all the menus in there. And then for Pyre, it was a cult plus books. <laughs> so, so the menu, there's a lot of like choir sounds and then like in the menu there's like page flipping, like turning pages and books closing and opening, uh, things like that. So, and, and those are things I just sort of selected and went with and, and ended up liking the results. Uh, so there are, 
are different approaches that you can take to making sound effects. Something that I did on Bastion in particular was I tried to start with realism. What, it, what would it sound like if you took this big hammer and swung it and hit something with it? What would that actually sound like? And then I started to realize quickly that it is not what you expect to hear in a game. Uh, you know, when you swing a big hammer, you're probably not going to swing it fast enough for it to make any sound, but in a game when you swing a big hammer, you expect there to be a big whoosh, like a huge crazy whoosh. And so, that, for example, that, that's, that's an example of, you know, exaggerating what would happen in reality quite a bit. Uh, and, and all the weapons for Bastion uh, had a lot of that, where I started from a place of realism and then just tried to exaggerate it as much as possible. If I went too far, then I'd pull it back. But it's easy to pull it back once you've gone too far. <laughs> That's how you know how far is too far, by going too far. So uh, repurposing sounds in surprising ways is something that I also like to do. Uh, for example, in Bastion, uh, there are tons of catapult sounds for all the whooshes I was talking about. Those are all like catapults, because that's the biggest whoosh I could possibly find was a catapult. It was whoosh, like a big, huge whoosh. Uh, so for the, for the, there's a, when you're trying to upgrade your weapons in Bastion, there's a menu there where when you're out of fragments, which is the currency, there's a sound that's like, hey, you're out of fragments. You can't buy that. And that sound is a combination of a zip tie and a duck. <laughs> and it works. And it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds like I'm out of fragments. You know? <laughs> sure. So uh, the question that I ask myself uh, at the beginning and then over and over again is, what is clearly missing sound? What's, what, what obviously just needs a sound effect when you look at the game? Uh, you know, swinging the hammer, hitting something, the box, hitting the box, the box breaking, you know, the enemy reacting to the hit, all that stuff is pretty obvious. You can, you can sort of imagine that that stuff would need sound. And then once you generate, hook up, and evaluate all that, then you, and then you repeat. Then, then once you evaluate it again, you'll be like, oh, well, now that there's sounds for these things, clearly these things, other things that don't have sound, uh, it sounds like there's something missing. So then you, then that, that clues you in into what's left to do. And that sort of, how I go about generating like sort of sound tasks for myself and determining what's left to do. So use any tools at your disposal is something I can't stress enough. Uh, that sort of part of this whole sort of guerrilla tactic is just anything that you can execute and do yourself, try it. Sample libraries, uh, again, are your friend. Logic, GarageBand, the internet. Actually, for, for sound effects, the internet has some decent stuff on it but uh, and some good free sort of Creative Commons licensed stuff that you can use, especially on student projects. Totally go nuts with that stuff. Uh, and synths. Uh, the synths are, are built into most DAWs, which for you non-audio people are digital audio workstations like GarageBand, Logic, Pro Tools, things like that. Most of them have built-in synthesizers that make all sorts of crazy sounds. You can just mess with those. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if you're doing a game that's particularly abstract or something or technological, uh, then you can uh, synth sounds are often appropriate for that kind of stuff, and you can just experiment. And then Foley, which is recording sounds yourself, actually, you know, doing it, micing things up. I didn't do much of that because I wasn't really well equipped for Foley, but I did a little bit. Uh, for Bastion, I, I did, there was like a plant, sort of plant-based enemies that you fight in Bastion. And so I thought for the impact sounds when you hit these plant-based enemies, it would be cool if I recorded myself like hitting an actual, you know, piece of fruit or something. So I, I, I got a pineapple and I was, recording myself hacking up this pineapple and it just didn't it sounded like it just didn't make a satisfying sound it sounded more like like gross and not appropriate like not the right thing so what i ended up doing is i took a the a sharpener and just whacked the the top of the pineapple what do you call that part i don't know the the plant part at the top of the pineapple uh, <laughs> uh, and that's what i ended up using for the impact sounds for when you hit uh plant-based enemies in, in bastion and mouth noises mouth noises are great uh, let me show you a clip from, uh, this is from Pyre. So I've removed the music just so you can focus on the sound design uh, and what's happening here. Uh, so I'm going to play this. This is, there's the, in particular, right at the end, there's a sound I want you to pay attention to where, um, I may skip ahead a little bit actually. Let me make sure we have time for everything. I'm going to skip ahead to the middle. <coughs> Thank you. 
that sound right there. That sound right there at the end uh, is comprised primarily of mouth noises. Let me show you. So this is the actual session in which I made that sound effect. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you some embarrassing outtakes of me making mouth noises into a microphone. Okay, so, so the sound that you actually hear in the game sounds like this. So let me play that one more time. So the, the mouth noises are just a layer of that. Let me, let me break it down for you a little bit. Oh, oh boy. How do I zoom in here? What's going on? There we go. Okay. Yeah. So we've got right up here, we've got the mouth noises. By itself, it sounds pretty stupid. <laughs> but we got a bunch of whooshes happening. So let me, put, let me put in a couple of whooshes here. And then there's this reverse whoosh at the end. I'll put that in too. So that's a lot of the texture of what you're hearing, actually. And then there's this sort of thing right at the end, a magic poof. An electric flutter happening. And all of that is sort of enhancing the mouth noises, or being enhanced by the mouth noises, uh, however you want to look at it. <laughs> so yeah, that, you can do some, some crazy stuff with mouth noises. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not going to knock it. I, the, the reason I decided to go and do that was because I saw a talk at Comic-Con that John Ottman was giving, who is, he did a lot of Brian Singer's movies. He's an editor and a composer. And he was saying that the sound of the like X-Men jet taking off is like, or, or landing was him going <laughs> like into a microphone. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna, all right. I can go do that. All right, implementation. So this is actually hooking up all the sounds, music and VO that you've generated. This is, if you will, this is the sort of hilt of the trident, uh, holding all the forks together. Using script to call the queue that you've made is essentially what, what this entails. Uh, so you make a queue uh, and then, wait, hold on. Let me just double check that I didn't go too far here. Nope, I didn't. Good. Sweet. And then, so middleware, yes, something that I want to talk to you about is middleware. This is how you get the audio files uh, into queues that are then called by the script. So uh, free basic tools like Exact and the built-in audio stuff in Unity. Uh, works. We used Exact for Bastion, which is a free Microsoft tool at the time. It is now defunct and it is not very good, so I don't mind. Uh, but fancy tools, uh, the industry standard wise, uh, I don't use that, but I hear it's awesome and very capable. FMOD Studio is what I happen to use. Uh, and I really like that because as an audio guy, it's all sort of timeline based like DAWs, like the digital audio workstations I was talking about. So. It's very much like looking in, in a logic session or something when you're looking at a project in FMOD. So uh, making cues. So this, this is something that's really important. This is how you set up the actual audio files that you've generated and you stick them into cues in your middleware. And so you set cue parameters when you do this. You, is it a 3D sound, meaning that does it play from a particular location in the stereo field, uh, in, in mono technically, and, or uh, is it 2D? playing equally from both speakers in stereo? Uh, is it distance attenuated? Does it get quieter as you're further away from it? Things like that. That's all the stuff that you do in the middleware when you set up the cues. Now, multi-sound cues uh, or pitch variants can also add variety. Uh, those are really good ways to do that. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate that. This is some uh, a capture of my actual uh, project for Pyre for, from FMOD. And uh, I'm just going to show you some of the menu sounds, which are those book, book sounds I referred to earlier. So that's pages flipping there. And then you can see, I'm going to pause it right here. Down here, you have all of the individual takes that I've rendered out and put into this playlist here. And any one of these can randomly play every time the queue is called. 
So you're adding some variety to a sound that's going to happen a lot. People can toggle through a whole bunch of stuff all at once, and you'll hear the sound super rapid fire. So, and, and then this green line right here indicates pitch variance, meaning uh, it's about three semitones down and three semitones up. So what that means is every time the sound plays, it'll randomly select a pitch in this six semitone range, uh, in addition to playing uh, one of these random takes. So it adds a ton of variance, and you don't feel like it, it repeats. Uh, and that's sort of a go-to thing when making, making cues, if you want to add variety. And you can also automate volume and things like that uh, as well. One more time. So there you go. Uh, implementation, the second. Scripting. Wait a minute. OK, yes, good. That's what that is. Scripting. OK, let's talk about scripting. So uh, CS majors, this is your home. Now you can finally breathe. <laughs> Woo, I understand this. OK, uh, <laughs> call VO cues. Is, okay, the, the things that scripting does, it does many things. It's, it calls VO cues. It's how you hook up sound cues to in-game actions. Uh, it starts and stops music and activates dynamic components. And that's all done with script. Uh, so let me show you another session here, which is a piece of music <laughs> from Pyre. Uh, and this is an, an F mod uh, in my F mod project here. Uh, let me just open this up here. It's got, I've got um, a bunch of tracks. In this, in this piece of music. And we've got a lot of dynamic stuff happening. Before I play it, let me just explain what's going on up here. Up here we have all these knobs that control the volumes of these different tracks. So you have guitars, mandolins, bass, flutes, miscellaneous, drums, and then something that's called end, which I'll talk about in a second. But basically, uh, I'm going to start playing it here. And you'll see that when I start playing it, it's just going to be the guitars. And then the mandolins, when I turn that knob up there, and the bass is going to enter here when I turn that knob up. And same with the flutes, the misc, et cetera. And the drums are in now. The drums, there's actually two drum tracks. Uh, and that's selected the first one. Now it's the second one. And so all of that gives you a ton of options and a ton of variety with a given piece of music. So to answer your question from earlier, actually, this is what I'm talking about. One of the ways in which you can avoid a player getting bored with a piece of music is that was something for Pyre that, that I took into account, because a player could sit on a particular screen in Pyre for a really long time. They could hang out in the caravan reading a book for hours. So I wanted to make it so there was something happening dynamically in a piece of music uh, to make it feel uh, like it was changing and not the exact same thing over and over again. And something that happened right at the end there I want to show you. This end knob is going to get turned. Take a look at that. And then what that means is that the next marker jump right to the end. And so that's a way that you can end pieces and have them feel finished without having to fade it out in the middle. Uh, and, and that was something that was a lot of fun. I basically have tempo markers all the way through the piece. And at, at measure breaks, then, then you can have it jump to the end. So uh, the tools that we use uh, for scripting at Supergiant are Visual Studio mostly, and some of us use ZeroBrain, uh, which are, are, are different tools for that. Uh, the language that we use is C Sharp, uh, and we use Lua. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> the thing I was just talking to you about, this is the script that controls the way this reacts dynamically, the music reacts dynamically in the game. So as you can see up here, we've got uh, you know, if it's a choice screen, then, and, and the intro is complete, and, it, well, I can't read it from here, but, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so then it, then it tells, just play the mandolins and flutes, turn those values to one, set everything else to zero, et cetera, and it does that for all these different states. So when you're, uh, when characters are talking to each other, that's one state. When you have a narration panel, which is what we call when there's text that you read but nobody's talking, it's a narration panel, there's another state. When you're traveling in the caravan, that's one state. When you go into it, it's a different state. So we have, because we have all these different stems that we can control independently, we have a ton of variety uh, with how we can call them. And, and, and I composed the piece so that they could all be called in any combination, basically, and, and pretty much work. So uh, we've come close to the end here. Uh, takeaways, yes, the trident of audio, music, voiceover, and sound. So everything 
should deepen immersion. That's sort of my, my go-to thing. Deepen immersion, reinforce tone, and provide feedback uh, with a special sort of caveat on provide feedback that, that actually uh, voiceover has, is uniquely capable of providing narrative and context. And so, and, and as, you know, as an audio director of me, uh, I end up doing all this stuff myself. And I expect many of you are gonna be doing the same thing too on your project, so uh, I wish you good luck with that. <laughs> Use what you have. There's no right way to do it, no one way. Do it any way that you feel like you can execute it. That's the right way to do it. it, it and that's, that ties back into the sort of guerrilla approach to, to audio that I take, which is do whatever you can execute, do it tactically, don't try to do something out of scope for yourself. Don't, I know, for example, that I'm not gonna be able to hire an orchestra. I don't know how to prepare music for an orchestra. I would have to hire somebody to do that for me. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's not something that I'm considering for myself, even though a lot of games use an orchestra, that's not right for my game because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, so ask yourself what's missing, start from there. Uh, specifically for sound design, that's really, really the most useful question you can ask for sound design. Another one I guess is, is this sound annoying if I play it a bunch of times? That's the other question. <laughs> but, but, but those two questions I use all the time. And uh, this can also be applied to the other aspects, uh, uh, music and, and voiceover as well. What's missing? Does this need music here? What kind of music? What's the tone of the music that's missing? What would enhance this moment? And then, you know, the way to get started is just dive in, start generating material to put in the game as soon as possible. And once you start putting the material in the game, that's really how you can properly judge whether or not you like it, what else the game needs, and so forth. And it goes on like that until the game is shipped. <laughs> that's it. Uh, questions? FL Studio? Yeah. I've actually never heard of FL Studio. So the question was, does the uh, program you use to make music matter? And uh, it's, a, it's a matter of taste. It's, it's just, uh, you know, I, I really fell in love with Logic because of how fast and easy it is to get from an idea to something that sounds pretty close and really good. They have a lot of fantastic presets, so it really is great for me for the way I compose uh, because part of the composition is the actual recording itself. So I, I'm able to get the ideas down really fast, and that's, that's one thing I love a lot about Logic. I've never actually used FL Studio. There's all sorts of great programs out there, though. I mean, Nuendo is one. I hear people recommend Cubase, uh, Ableton, things like that. Uh, Pro Tools is an uh, industry standard. You know, I learned on that, but it's not my favorite. Is that it? Yeah. Don'ts? Don'ts? Uh, well, let's see, some don'ts. Uh, one of them is, yeah, the thing I mentioned right at the end about is the sound annoying or not? So <laughs> something that you'll want to ask yourself, just try to put yourself in the position of the player. And, it, you know, let's see, I'm going to hook this sound up to a, a rapid fire weapon and you're gonna hear the sound a million times over the course of the game. Is it a sound that I'm gonna get sick of after hearing it a million times? So, so try to avoid, I guess the don't is, try to avoid making something that'll be grating or tiresome for people to hear over and over again. Does that make sense? Great. Other, qu yes. Are there any questions? So the question was, are there uh, soundtracks I would point to as being sort of a perfect example of, of this stuff? Um, <laughs> I can't, I'm not going to pick my own, that's lame. Uh, no, I think, uh, I actually really love the soundtrack for uh, Abzu uh, by Austin Wintory. I think that game has a really, really beautiful score and really enhances the tone, deepens, it does all the things actually. It is reactive to what's happening in the game. It's, it's, it's very tightly scored with what's happening to you, to the player. And it's, it's really, really cool. Beautiful soundtrack, lots of harps and awesome aquatics sounding things. It's, it's really great. Yeah. So I'm sorry. That's a good question. So the, the question was, what's the sort of balance between me creating stuff on my own and, and working with the team? I, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. You know, it's, it varies from project to project. On Bastion, it was very heavily collaborative because there were so few of us. It was the first thing. We were always talking back and forth about, you know, what should we do? What's, what should the next step be? What's this, you know, what's, what should the vibe of this next thing be? Um, but as from, you know, I, I, sort of my independence has grown a little bit from the rest of the team, even though now I'm working in-house, actually, ironically, uh, as the projects go on, because I sort of have a better sense, I've made a couple games, now I have a better sense of, I can generate that stuff myself, I don't need to ask Greg and Amir what they think I should do next, 
uh, if that makes sense. So yeah, but that being said, I mean, th there's, there's a lot of value to the sort of collaborative effort, at least making sure you're on the same page creatively with everybody else before you sort of run off and, and do, do your own thing. And checking back in uh, every once in a while <laughs> is, is a good idea. Yeah, do one more? Uh, yeah, follow-up. Well, you know, th that's a good question. Is there anything I would change about the games that I've done uh, sound-wise? And I think, you know, maybe, maybe on Bastion, uh, there, because we were using such a basic uh, audio engine, basic middleware, uh, there was some stuff that like, you just couldn't do. You couldn't cleanly loop anything, for example. So all the ambiences fade out and start again, so when they loop, right? So, for example, that's something that's a seam that I wish I could go back and cover up, but it was sort of a limitation of the stuff we were using and, you know, yeah. But that, no, creative choice-wise, not really, but uh, I, I'm, I've gotten pretty good at sort of, once I kick it out the door, I say goodbye and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm done with that and I don't want to George Lucas it to death, you know. <laughs> no, 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 hey, I don't want to start anything. <laughs> <laughs> you can, people can like whatever they like, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, what criteria do I use to decide whether or not to randomize a sound? And, and really, it's just trying it and playing it real fast <laughs> in, the, in, the, you know, in FMOD and seeing how it sounds without randomization. I sort of default to randomization these days because it tends to be the right choice. Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't actually work as well. Like if the sound has any pitch to it, for example, if it's like, you know, for example, like on, uh, you know, when you're toggling through tiles on the PlayStation or something, it's got like a ping, 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 you know, it's like a pitch. And so if you randomize that, it would sound super weird because it has a pitch that would be like wrong, uh, you know, most of the time when you hear it. So, so it's just, you gotta take it on a case by case basis, but it's, it's really just about listen to the sound you've made, play it really fast in succession, see if it, if it needs the randomization. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. How important is scripting and technical implementation knowledge as a composer? It's, I, that's a really hard question for me to answer. I don't know is the, is the answer because, so I, I, a lot, most composers are freelance composers who work for, uh, you know, different companies who hire them to do the soundtrack. A and so uh, I don't know what level of implementation people expect when they commission music. I don't really know like what level of implementation composers expect when they deliver music generally. But, but for me, I certainly don't have a vast knowledge of the music implementation. That, a lot of that stuff is I don't even do myself. I do it kind of with Greg, like we sit there and do it together, uh, for, at least on Pyre. But, um, but yeah, it's a thing that I, and I learn more about it each project. It's still the thing that is the most like voodoo magic to me uh, <laughs> of all the, all the aspects of my job. But uh, yeah, I think having, you know, the more knowledge you can have of that scripting component, the better. Sure. Yeah. Like you say, oh, I want, I want this boost to like hit like right before the, the weapon hits, but yeah. too close. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, that's, so that's a good, uh, good question. The question was um, how, do you, you know, how do you communicate to someone else implementing it how you want it implemented? And, and you know, I, I've done sort of the gamut on this one. On Bastion, I basically told like, hey, Gavin, can you put this sound in like this? You know, I, I think it should sound like that. And I, and I very did, just did like a little bit of scripting, but not very much. And sort of our sort of go-to method for hooking stuff up these days is if you can, try to hook it into an animation. It's super, super easy to get it to play exactly when you want if you hook it into an animation. There are just fewer things that can go wrong. If the animation isn't playing, the sound isn't gonna play. <laughs> uh, so so that, that's sort of the simplest way that we've found to, to hook stuff up. Um, but yeah, there's, that's a sort of a big question. It's, it's, tough, it's tough to communicate uh, with people who, from a different discipline, uh, if you don't have the, the words that they're familiar with from their discipline, uh, if that makes sense. So, so learn, the more you know about that stuff, the easier it'll be to either hook it up yourself or communicate how you want it hooked up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. And I will say Gavin Simon is particularly awesome for an engineer uh, who had like, communicating with other disciplines and like being really understanding of what they're asking and, <laughs> and speaking like norm, you know, person language, not like computer, computer speak. Uh, so that, that's, really, that's really good. Any other questions?
so, <laughs> so the, yeah, the question is, would I prefer having people that I, I work with in audio or, or prefer doing it myself? I mean, I, you know, I think there's, there are some benefits to being able to do it yourself in that it, it's just you're able to do things more quickly. Anytime you have more people involved with something, the sort of management overhead goes up and the time it takes to communicate back and forth about something increases. Uh, so, you know, I have a good idea of what I want it to be like. So if I go and make it, chances are it'll be more like that than if I tell somebody else, hey, I want it to be like this. Then they'll do their idea of what that is. And that is an awesome way to collaborate. And, you know, if, you, if you're working with people who you really trust and are great and you have, like, a, a good understanding of each other's tastes, then I don't think that maybe would be a bad thing at all. Uh, I've just never really, never really done it. I guess the one time, so on, on Transistor, I had a baby like right towards the end of the project and got really behind. <laughs> so, so we, um, we commissioned some, some of the sound effects for Transistor. And that's sort of my only experience with talking, trying to communicate with somebody else how to do you know, what you have in your head, basically. And, and it was a challenge. We had to go back and forth with them quite a bit. Uh, to, to really get to, to what we had in mind creatively, like all the whole team and myself included. So it's certainly a challenge to do that sometimes uh, if you're not on the same page as somebody. But if you are, you know, it could, I'm sure it could be awesome. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah. Sure, yeah. So the question was what, what sort of jobs are available for people interested in audio in, in the game industry? And, and um, I don't have a great sense of that, kind of, because I'm sort of isolated from a lot of that stuff um, by being a full-time employee of Supergiant, and that's sort of what I do. I'm not like hunting around forums for gigs and stuff. Uh, so I, I <laughs> the short answer is I don't know, uh, but I know that there are you know a bunch of pe games that need sounds <laughs> and and hire people out for that stuff. Uh, I know. There is a particular, if you, if you want to contact somebody who really knows about that, I would contact Power Up Audio. They're based, I think, in British Columbia. They're in Vancouver. And they do the sound for like every indie game that has good sound, basically. They're like, they're all over the place. They, they did uh, Darkest Dungeon, and they do like the Tower Fall. They did, uh, they, did, they did Tooth and Tail. They did, you know, they just do like, they do everything. Uh, and those guys are great. Kevin Regami is a really uh, talented dude. And they, they are guns for hire. They are not, you know, on team. Uh, so they're, they're really good people. And they also actually have a podcast called Real Talk, R-E-E-L, and they actually listen to people's sound reels, sound design reels, and sort of uh, critique them and just say, oh, this is how it can improve. This is what, you know, if I got this reel, like as somebody who's hiring an audio person. So, so that, that's a good place to look. He's a really good resource, um, but unfortunately I am not <laughs> for that. Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the question is, how did I figure, when, when I'm making sounds, how, did I, how do you figure out that stuff like a zip line and a duck will make sense together and, and achieve what I wanted to? I mean, I basically, a lot of it is just like flipping through my giant sound library, listening to like every sound, and, and trying to, to feel my reaction to the sound. It, you know, if, if, if you don't really know exactly what it should sound like, then I generally fall back on like, how should it feel? Like, what should the feeling of this be? And so you can't, like the feeling of you can't buy something, you know, at a store, you're out of money, is like a <laughs> Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, okay, that works. It's a quack, sure. Um, it feels like a quack. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's sort of how I got there, if that makes sense. Yeah? Um, like yeah, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. The question was, uh, in a multiplayer game, you know, sort of what, is there a difference in approach, basically? Uh, and, and so, so actually, Pyre does have a multiplayer component. It's not, uh, it's not online, but it's a local multiplayer. And, and I think uh, there are some considerations there, uh, especially with if you're doing reactive narration like, like we're doing, uh, you have to sort of change the way you refer to the player. So you have to like refer to the specific teams they're using instead of saying you. Like you can't do second person anymore. You have to do that. So that's, that's one way in which the approach has to change. Um, uh, another way is you, you know, being very, you know, being very clear about who, what is making what sound, having your sort of stereo positioning for everything really on point, making sure that it's clear, like, the dude over here fired a gun, the sound came from here in the stereo image. The dude over here, you know, got hit, the sound came from there. So, so separating all that stuff is going to be valuable for players uh, when they're playing. Last question. 
All right. One more, it sounds like. One more, anybody? Yep. Yeah. Avoid seeing too much like what your source material is. Sure. So, so the question was, if you're inspired by other sources, how do you avoid kind of copying the source material? I generally don't like placeholder music myself uh, for the reason of, you know, I, I have a, a brother who's a video editor, and, you know, I hear the sort of uh, <laughs> the same story every time that, you know, you have a placeholder in there, everybody falls in love with it, and then what ends up happening, I, I, before I did this, I, I did a little bit of sort of commission work, and I did some stuff for TV a little bit, and basically 100% of the time it was like, well, we have this placeholder Coldplay song. Can you just like rip that off, but not in a like in a legally okay kind of way? Um, so that's why that's kind of why I, I, I kind of don't like to use placeholder stuff. If you need something in there, by all means, it's totally cool. But but just know that that tends to happen with placeholder music is you tend to just like it because it's there and you're used to it, uh, no matter what, <laughs> essentially. So um, so I you know I try to stay away from it. And, and I don't really use that in my workflow. But, but I do look to other people for inspiration. Uh, for example, on you know, Transistor, Image and Heap, Radiohead, and a couple few artists were like really specifically inspirations for me for the music for those games. But mostly it was just a feel sort of thing, a tone thing. Like sometimes I do a thing that was personally like a little homage to something, but, but isn't, isn't a rip off at all. It's like, a, oh, I like this. The way the bass sounds on that Radiohead song, I'm going to make my bass sound like that for this part of this song. Yeah, I like that, you know. But but it's it's you know it's not you know I, I'm not directly copying anything uh, if that makes sense. Great, thanks so much. Thank you.